You're watching Hawthorne Community Television, Channel 22, quality programming for the city of Hawthorne. Hi, I'm HCTV's Marissa Amane. Hawthorne's a great place to live in. Lots of events throughout the year that bring the community close together. You're about to watch the best of Hawthorne 2001, so stick around. You may see some people you know and even maybe yourself. You're watching HCTV 22 City News. Your source for news and information on issues, people, arts and entertainment, and sports in the city of Hawthorne. In this edition of City News, put on your dancing shoes and get ready for the party of your life, Cuban style. Plus, a lifetime of waiting, a Hawthorne veteran gets a very belated thank you for saving someone's life in the Korean War. And we'll give you a peek at how Hawthorne police break in their new cops on the beat. That and much more coming up on City News. Hi, I'm Linda Alberici. And I'm Anna Marcos. Welcome to City News. Well, Hawthorne police are hard at work beefing up their police force. After some lean times, they're recruiting more new officers than ever before. We went along for the ride as one rookie officer learned the ropes. Rookie officer Mike Grajeda loads his gun and he's ready for his 12-hour night shift. He's one of eight new trainees Hawthorne police are breaking in. They're trying to play catch-up to make up for years of funding cuts. This is one of the first times that we've ever had this many trainees out here. That's unprecedented. Yes, it actually is. Uh, we've faced shortages for many years. Grajeda and one of his training officers, David Greger, hop in the cruiser dubbed the boy car, and they're off. Boy car, the training car, is the primary car on all calls. Uh, traffic accidents, report calls, murders, whatever comes up. This rookie has made it through the police academy. Now he's into his 17-week field training. He's already under enough pressure, so police policy won't allow him to interview on camera. The first thing that comes up tonight, a neighbor's complaint of loud music. You know, we'd like to stop a little ways back so we're not seen or we have time to react if something does happen. Even on a routine call, Grajeda is learning he can take nothing for granted. And the people he calls on don't always cooperate. It's just gonna talk to you for a minute. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a deal. The resident won't talk, but the two officers give him a warning and move on. Grajeda is ready for his next lesson of the night. When the lights go down, the whole city sort of changes. Uh, Mr. Grajeda will start, we ask him to look around as he drives by businesses to see if he sees anybody. And he's looking for traffic violations. He's looking for anything out of the ordinary. Grajeda makes a traffic stop. Then a call comes in on a hit and run. The boy car arrives on the scene. The hit and run victim claims he was riding his bike when a driver cut him off and hit him. The cop in training must now take a detailed report out in the field. It's rigorous training. Out of 100 who initially apply to the Hawthorne Police Department, only one or two will actually make it. Grajeda knows he could still get bumped from the police department if he fails his field training. Back at the station, another challenge. Time to book a 12-year-old boy caught with a stolen bike. Then, more reports and more paperwork. No, no, because it's a, it's a 496, just write it as, as a cold, as a straight 496. He's been out of the academy for five weeks, and uh, it's not relatively easy. The, the academy is usually the easier part because it's so structured. This is very ad lib now. He's got to put everything that he knows all together. Interviewing techniques, interrogation techniques, um, evidence locating, finding, documenting. A busy night so far, but it's only half over, and Grajeda's still got 12 more weeks of training to go. Anna Marcos for HCTV. The phrase better late than never takes on a whole new meaning in our next story. It's about a Hawthorne resident who's finally getting recognized for his service in the Korean War nearly half a century later. Hello. Hi, um, how can I help you? Edward Foster helps people get back into the workforce every day at the Torrance One Stop Career Center. But you could say he's a born helper, even helping save someone's life in the Korean War. Korea, 1952. In a battle like this one, Foster's 2nd Infantry Division comes under enemy attack. How about 
minute or two into the barrage, I heard a guy yell, medic. Instead of running for cover, Foster, a trained medic, runs out to help him. I just knew this one thing. There's a guy out there that needed help. And it was my job to go out there and help him. Foster never saw the man again and doesn't even know his name. If I didn't stop to bleed him, he would have died. Three days later, in the Battle of Porkchop Hill, Foster gets hit in his left side, nearly becoming a casualty himself. He goes into a coma for four months, but eventually recovers, goes back to his life, and moves to the South Bay. It's not until 1975 that Foster applies for a GI loan and discovers his military records are lost. Basically, there's a backlog plus all my military records that were shipped to St. Louis, where they keep all the military records, was destroyed in the fire. That's when Foster began writing letters and trying to piece together his military puzzle. It gave me a project, and I was determined to complete it. And his determination came in part from a speech given long ago by Dr. Martin Luther King. That was the day that I picked up two words that has become very important to me all my life, patience and persistence. Over many years, spanning close to five decades, Edward Foster says he sent out 2,200 letters to agencies, comrades, officials. Here are just a few of them. To Senator Feinstein, Senator Boxer, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, all in hopes of getting what he deserves. And now he's finally getting recognized. Corporal Foster immediately left his place of cover and with complete disregard for his personal safety, ran to the side of the wounded man. But all his medals, pins, patches, and certificates are fringe benefits. Foster says the real rewards come from helping other vets get the records they need. And that makes me feel good because I know that I'm helping others out there. And there's a lot of vets that need that help. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to go about doing it. It gives him particular joy to work with the veterans and with the seniors in our community. I look out here and I see many people that are veterans that have been denied benefits. I say to all of them that might read this or hear my voice, don't give up. And maybe they won't give up because you didn't, Sergeant Foster. For HCTV, I'm Linda Alberici. Losing her high school is going for the gold. It's trying to clinch a CIF title, one of California's top athletic student championships. And it's got at least one ace in its hand, a shot put champ who's already broken plenty of records. But is it enough? Let's take a look. Losing her highs, coach Elliot White was keeping a close eye on his track athletes in this three-team meet at El Segundo High School, the last of the year. Good scores here would put Losinger's Olympians in a winning position for the finals and the league championships. They might even have a shot at the number one California athletic prize, a CIF title. For coach White, it was pins and needles time. We got a lot of guys fighting for it today, so I'm going to have to watch this one and uh, I'll get right back to you here. After this meet, Losinger did send four athletes, all throwers, to the CIF finals. Oh, we're real confident going in the league finals because we got a, uh, his, his personal best is at least nine feet better than anyone else's. And all our throwers are, so we're, we're hoping for a sweep. One of the top contenders, shot put athlete David Gurren. Gurren recently achieved a personal best when he threw 62.2 feet, breaking the school record for a fifth time. We asked him what was his secret. Explode. Explode? Explode. What do you mean? Just, just throw hard as you can. Just, just explode on something. Just explode like a dynamite. Meanwhile, Coach White celebrated another victory and hoped the Olympians' winning streak would carry over into the CIF finals. Anna Marcos for HCTV. By the way, Dave Guerin, his brother Joe, and two other throwers 
have now qualified for the CIF Masters Meet. Well, coming up, you think boot camp is tough. Meet an ROTC drill team that's marching ahead no matter what the pressure. And from marching ahead to rolling forward, the Hawthorne High Robotics team takes their high-tech wonder on the road. And get ready for some spicy dance moves as we take you to Hawthorne's fifth annual Cuba Fest. It's all next. Welcome back. A new dress code piloted at three Hawthorne schools is now almost a year old, and we wanted to find out if it's still a perfect fit. So we hit the runways, or a hallways, at Eucalyptus School. Walking single file from class to class, no one can single out another student for wearing something uncool. That's because they're all wearing basically the same thing. The clothes are now less of a distraction for the students. You know, kids always get made fun of regardless of what happens, but with the uniforms or the dress code, they have one less thing to worry about getting ready for school. Everybody looks the same in school. That's why fifth grader Julio Batres says he doesn't miss his regular clothes. When people um, use regular clothes and people make fun of it, that's why people should wear the uniform. They say, you shouldn't wear that those clothes, you, to, you should wear cool clothes. And this is about as cool as it gets. But Christopher Robles and many other students agree, it's not too shabby. Is it comfortable? Yes. Is it fun to wear? Yes. Do you think everybody looks good in it? Yes. And more importantly, mom says it's much more convenient. He just pick it up from his, um, or whatever they are and just pick it up and put it on and he's be ready by 7.30. So far only about 5% of parents don't really like the look-alike idea so they've signed a waiver allowing their kids to wear the clothing of their choice. Uh, there's been a high degree of participation. Uh, the principals have noticed uh, less fighting, better behavior and it has been a very much a success. So although I'm wearing navy blue today, I'm still way out of uniform. Number one, wrong color shirt. It should be white, yellow, or light blue. Number two, wrong shoes, no slip-ons allowed. And number three, my skirt is just a little too short. So a teacher might remind me what the proper way to dress is, but I wouldn't get in trouble. Child cannot be reprimanded or punished in any way um, or their grades suffer or anything in any way because of not wearing the uniform. Fifth grader Katricia Nunn says she likes knowing what to wear every day and thinks all Hawthorne schools should try it. You should wear a uniform because like um, maybe it'll bring your school out, maybe it'll be something special for your school, maybe it'll be something coming for your school and show a good example for your school. I think they're actually they're very attractive. The kids look really cute in them. They're all uniform. It's easy to say, you know, that they look, they look all blended together. They all look like part of a team. And the kids think that too. They all feel like they're more part of a team. And let's hope the teamwork leads to better schoolwork as well. For HCTV, I'm Linda Alborisi. Maybe it's the early morning drills. Maybe it's the trophies. Whatever it is, Hawthorne High School's ROTC members are all marching to the same beat. The going can get kind of tough, but this team is tougher. Hawthorne High School's ROTC drill teams are proud to show their colors. Growing support this year has doubled ROTC enrollment to 200 students. This is the hardcore group, the 45 cadets who make up six drill teams. They practice several times a week, putting their strength, agility, and discipline to the test. They drill after school, before school, and sometimes in the wee hours of the morning. How uh, devoted do you have to be? Um, really, really devoted. Um, the earliest we've been out here has been, I'd say, between 3.30 and 4. Besides the color guard, there's an unarmed team, an armed team, two four-man teams, 